wherever you are in your homes, I just want you to lift your voice, lift your hands up and just exalt the name of Jesus. For he is worthy to be praised. Heavenly Father, we give you praise. We give you all the glory. We give you all the honor. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for your presence in this place. We thank you, Jehovah my God. Because where two or three are gathered in your name, then there you are, Jehovah. Father, we give you glory. We give you all the honor. Be lifted up, Lord. Be exalted above all other names, Jehovah my God. Let my heart worship you this day. Let all that I am give glory to your name, Jehovah my God. We give you praise, Jehovah. We bless your name, Jesus. You are worthy. You are lifted up, O God. You are exalted, King of glory. You reign above all other names, Jehovah. You reign above all other names, Jesus. You are enthroned and exalted above all other. We give you praise, O God. We give you all the glory. We give you all the honor. It is by your spirit. It is by your spirit, O God, that we worship. It is by your grace. It is by you, O Lord, my God, that we give glory. Glory to Jehovah. May your name be lifted up, Lord. We give you praise. We give you all the honor. We bless your name, Jesus. Elohim, Adonai, Yahweh, wewe ni mungu wa kweli. Elohim,
Jesus be lifted up in this place and in our lives and in our homes. We bless you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We worship you, God. about today, even as we come to us this morning, what a song. Maybe let's just do it one more time. Amazing love, how can it be? Let's do it one more time, then we proceed. And as we do it, we'd like you to join us in your living rooms, in whatever part of your house where you are. We want to welcome you to join us in this service as we do one more time. Amazing love. I mean, I am forgiven because you are forsaken. I want to welcome you to join us as we do this. you are 
today wherever you're watching us from thank you so much for tuning in to IVC as we come to uh, share with you the word of the Lord uh, from our hearts this morning thank you so much worship team God bless you we appreciate your work thank you very much allow us to turn to our text which we have been studying for the last few Sundays and our text is in the book of first Corinthians chapter 13 we are dealing with the subject, I mean the subject of love because this is so critical in the days in which we live. Understanding what love is and uh, understanding the application of love in our present contemporary society. We have explained that one of the most misused and abused word is the word love. People use it for their own purposes and at times the real original implication of the word love is ignored and this leads to abuse, misuse and misplacement. So what we are doing today is to proceed with the subject. We, last, last Sunday we talked about a few things uh, about love from this particular text. Allow me to go to our text this morning and our text is in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 from verse 1 to verse 7. I'm reading from the NIV version of the Bible. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a cl clanging cymbal. Verse 2. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Verse 3, if I give all possessions to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, um, I, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. Verse 5, it is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily anchored. It keeps no record of wrongs. In our last service, we talked about love is patient, love is kind, love does not envy. We mentioned all those. Now today, we want to look at this subject, love does not keep records. It does not keep records. Now, in order to understand all this, we have to ask ourselves a question. If love does not keep re records of wrong, how does it work around that? The key and critical work, word or statement here is forgiveness. It does not keep records. 
of all the ills and the wrongs done against it. In other words, the ills come, the wrongs come, but love deals with them in a way that the records are not kept. Let me tell you a story that happened during the revolutionary time in the, in the, in the U.S. I read this from an encyclopedia. There was a pastor called Miller. This pastor had a neighbor who was very, very cruel. This neighbor did not love the pastor at all. He spoke all manner of evil things, did all manner of things against the pastor. I mean, to the extent that the pastor had to learn to tolerate him. He was not only an enemy to the pastor. The story says he was also an enemy to the state. So he was arrested, taken to court, and was sentenced to hang. He was 60 miles away, which is about 90 kilometers away from where Miller was living. When Miller heard about the day this man was going to be hung, Miller walked 60 miles to go and ask for permission from General George Washington for, so that this man is not killed. The man who has caused him trouble, the man who has abused him all the time. He went to George Washington and said, please, General, I would like you to forgive this man. George Washington told him, no, I can't. Let your friend die. This man looked at George Washington and said, no, he is my enemy, number one. The things he has done to me, done to the church, are things which are so bad I can't even mention. George Washington looked at this pastor and he said, because of your forgiving heart, I'm going to forgive him. So Miller walked quickly to where the gallows were, where this guy was about to be hung. When he was approaching it, the man shouted that, oh, my enemy has made sure he has walked 60 kilometers to come and see me die. Before he finished speaking, Miller ran so fast with a letter from General Washington and gave it to the executioner and said, this man is forgiven. He is forgiven. Who, who sought his forgiveness? The one he hated, the one he spoke ill about, is the one who sought his forgiveness. Ladies and gentlemen, forgiveness keeps away records, does not store, and it comes out of love. A man by the name Martin was in Hitler's prison for a long time. As he walked out, this is what he said, and I quote, it took me a long time to learn that God is not the enemy of his enemies, end quote. It took me a long time to learn that God is not an enemy of his enemies. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to say this to you before I go very far in this teaching this morning. I would like to say this, you will be wronged in any place here on earth and by anybody. You will be wronged, you will be hurt. It does not matter where you go, people will hurt you. It does not matter which place it will be, you will be hurt, you will be betrayed, your trust will be broken. People you trust will betray you. People give you promises, will turn against those pro same promises. If some of them will even break vows. People will hurt you. People will betray you. Now, I'm said anywhere, in any human society, and this includes even church, religious circles, a lot of people are actually carrying scars and pain from the institution of the church or other religious places. Now, those are places where you expect harmony, joy, peace, people flowing together. But when you go and begin to talk to people one by one, they will tell you how they have been hurt 
in religious institutions. That tells you of the level of immaturity and of the level of misunderstanding of the concept of love. Ladies and gentlemen, you can be hurt even in the family. Parents can hurt you. The things we are reading now happening all over this country and all over the world at this time, what people are doing to their own children is, is disgusting. It's amazing. People hurt each other. Brothers are hurting brothers. Sisters are hurting their own sisters. There is such a pain uh, and, and cost within homes that it is even hard now to know what is going on in terms of uh, uh, harmony and living together in family relationships. The story of Joseph is a good story. Joseph was subjected to very strange stuff by his own family members. There was jealousy from his own brothers. When he showed them the dream he had, he had a good dream. The dream was so great, he saw himself, the sun, the moon, and the stars bowing before him. I mean, he saw it, a vision from God. Instead of getting support from his, bro from his brothers, they came in with jealousy. And they developed evil intentions against Joseph, their own brother. They had malicious plots against Joseph. Selfish disregard against Joseph. And they, I mean, the father sent him to see where they were taking care of their cattle or animals. When they saw him in the rope he was wearing, the rope was a robe of honor from his father. When they saw him, they said, there comes the dreamer. They killed an animal, soaked the, the rope in blood, put their own brother in a pit. I even don't know if he had any other clothes on him. They sold him into slavery. Jealousy, evil scheming, evil planning by his own brothers. He was taken to Egypt, went through so much pain, so much suffering because of betrayal from family members. Those he leaned on, those he trusted. Finally, he became a leader in Egypt. He was number two to Pharaoh. And then, of course, hunger came into his own land, Canaan. His family came to Egypt to seek food. The scripture is very interesting. When you begin looking at Genesis chapter 50, uh, allow me to turn there. Genesis chapter 50 from verse 15. The brothers had come, the family had come, they had lived in Egypt. Their father Jacob had died. And now that Jacob had died, the brothers were concerned about what Joseph will do to them. They thought Joseph was going to revenge what they did. And listen to this conversation that developed between them and Joseph. Verse 15 to verse 21. When Joseph's brother saw that their father was dead, they said, perhaps Joseph will hate us and may actually repay us for all the evil which we did to him. So they sent messengers to Joseph. And so Joseph, after the father died, the brothers came to him. They were worried. They were concerned what Joseph was going to do. And uh, verse 15, when Joseph's brother saw that their father was dead, they said, perhaps Joseph will hate us and may actually repay us for all the evil which we did to him. Verse 16, so they sent messengers to Joseph saying, before your father died, he commanded saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. Now Joseph, please forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, I mean went, and fell down before his face. And they said, Behold, we are your servants. Wow, listen to that. 
Verse 19, Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, in order to bring it about as it is this day, to save many people alive. Verse 21, Now therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Listen to that. He comforted them and he spoke kindly to them. This is a man who was sold in slavery by family, his own brothers. But he forgave them. His attitude was the attitude of forgiveness. And he released them completely from the situation. Ladies and gentlemen, you can be hurt by family members. They can hurt you so badly that you don't even know what to do. And I want to urge you to appreciate the reality. Because when you appreciate it, when it happens, then you know what to do. Now, what is, uh, what is forgiveness? I would like us to define the term forgiveness. Uh, I, would, I would like us to look at it from a kind of a broad perspective. The, 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 the Greek word for forgiveness kind of has to, we have to use so many English words to be able to bring it, to clarify it. And so these are the words that are actually uh, from English that, that bring forth the clarity of forgiveness. It means to remit, R-E-M-I-T, like a debt. You remit like a debt. It means to leave something or someone alone. Live alone. Something or someone. Live alone. It means to allow, probably an action. You allow. It means to leave or to send away. To desert or to abandon. Those are some of the, the, the implications of that word. Now, it is choosing not to hold an offense against someone. That's what forgiveness is. You make a choice that you are not going to hold an offense against a person. This person, you have a right to hold an offense, but you choose not to hold an offense. It is also not, it's choosing not to dwell on the offense or continue to rehearse it in your thoughts. The offense is there, but you choose not to rehearse it in your thoughts. Were you offended? Yes. Was it real? Yes. Were you hurt? Yes. Were you betrayed? Yes. But then you look at all that, and then you choose to say, okay, I will not dwell on that offense. I will not keep rehearsing it in my heart. That's what we are talking about. Forgiveness. It means choosing, it is choosing not to keep a record. You did this, and then you did this, and then you also did this. And because you did all this, now I am tired. I am fed up. I am also going to do this. When you go to courts, particularly courts where there are family issues, issues, husbands and wives and whatever, um, may, at times divorce cases, you hear somebody say, he did this to me. He cheated on me. So I also revenged by cheating on him or her. And those things keep coming. What he's saying here is, you choose not to keep a record of the ills, the pains, the betrayals that have been done against you. You make up your mind, I will not keep a record of these things. It is an act, it is the act of, a, of pardoning an offender. You say, okay, you offended me, but I pardon you completely. Now, this is something you only do by decision. And I'm coming to that ahead, ahead to explain how this works. But let me say this before I move ahead on this subject. Forgiveness does not do the following. It does not condone 
the act or the offense. To forgive does not mean you celebrate the offense. You want to make it clear, I'm forgiving, but this offense is not something we need to, con to, 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 uh, to condone or appreciate. It's wrong. It should not be condoned. It should not be appreciated. And this is the truth, the reality. So when you forgive, it is not condoning the issue. I think it's good for me to say that. Uh, next, forgiveness is not pretense. It's not to pretend that the offense never happened. It's not a pretense. The offense happened. So forgiveness is not kind of saying, oh, you know, I'm assuming it never happened. Uh-uh. That is not forgiveness. Also, forgiveness does not allow others to take advantage of you. It does not mean that now you're giving people a reason to keep taking advantage of you all the time. This is not forgiveness. That is not the key, the purpose of forgiveness. So what you are doing here is, okay, I am forgiving, I'm letting go. But this behavior, I want you to know I'm not something to condone. And it is not something, I'm not assuming it did not happen, it happened. You hurt me and I was hurt. I choose to forgive. And so you do not allow people to take advantage of you because you are a forgiving person. Now, I want to move to the process of forgiveness. And let me give you my testimony. Some years ago, in 1984, uh, we were in another town. And... Uh, 1983, December, we went for an overnight prayer meeting to cross the year in a place called Mumias. And we had this meeting with the Mumias brethren. And one of the brothers we had gone with to that meeting did something that offended me in that overnight prayer meeting. I was actually hurt. I was actually offended. So this is what I did. We left the meeting in the morning. We went back to Kakameka town. For three months, I was hurting. And I never talked to this man of God. He was a happy man, preaching. We all was together in prayer meetings. He did not even know what I was going through. Until April of, of 1984, we had a, a, a rally in the social hall and we had invited a lady by the name Margaret Wangare from Banana Hill. And she preached a message. And she explained how there was a, somebody in that meeting who was hurting because of what somebody did to him earlier. And he, knew, he needed to forgive. In fact, she said, the person who hurt you is also in this meeting. So I went to this brother and I explained to him. I told him, you know, what you did actually hurt me. I've been painting for the last three months. Now he was surprised, actually shocked. He said, what? I never meant anything uh, to, um, to hurt you. We hugged each other and prayed together. And that afternoon, the leader of the ministry that time came and told me, hey, somebody's supposed to go and preach in a certain place. Uh, the service, the Kesha is on in a, an assembly of God somewhere. Um, like one and a half hours away. Can you go? I actually went for the mission and I preached in that overnight prayer meeting when I met an, uh, I met an altar call. Almost, not almost, everybody came to be prayed for, including the pastor and all the leaders. The level of anointing that night was higher than the, the, the one I had moved in in the past three months. Forgiveness is a process, and I want to highlight a few things in the next few minutes. One, you need to make the decision to forgive. This is simple, but think about it. Somebody has betrayed you. 
Somebody has caused you pain. I read the story of this lady who came to her house and found the husband with another lady in her own house. What does she do? Does she forgive or walk away? You've got to make up the decision. You've got to say, yes, I am betrayed. Yes, I am hurt. But I'm choosing to forgive. It has to be a choice. If you don't make the decision, it will be a hazard. You cannot do it properly. It has to be a clear decision you make. And the reason why I'm saying you have to make the decision is that nobody can make it for you. If people try to ask you, please forgive him, please forgive, the pleading and begging, as long as it is not from you, cannot help. It has to come out of your heart. You have to say, I forgive you. That decision has to be made. Number two, ask God for help. Forgiveness at times can be tough. Absolutely tough. Because the pain is there. The betrayal is there. You need God's help. A friend of mine, I said this in our last Sunday in a radio program. A friend of mine, a very good man of God from another country, he was going for a mission in another country. He told his wife, can we go? She said, no, me, I want to be home this time. So he went alone, finished the mission, came back home. Before he came back, it was, it, actually she was found in an affair with another guy who is not even, who is not even a, a Christian. The, because this friend of mine is a, is a big name in his country, it went to the media, it was on television, it was in the newspapers. So and so's wife found. What do you think he would do as he flew back home? He came to the airport. The easiest thing to do would have been, hey, pack and go. But this man of God went to the place of prayer, fasted for three days. He asked God, what do I do? He was seeking the help of God. What do I do? My name is messed up in the newspapers, on television. What should I do? He was reminded of how much God has forgiven him. He was reminded of how, of, of, uh, of how unrighteous he is or was. He came home, forgave her. The whole country was surprised, but people learned a lesson that there's something called forgiveness when there is help from God. Forgiveness. Who is this that has hurt you that you don't have strength to forgive? What kind of betrayal have you gone through that even for you to say, I forgive you, those words are hard to come out of your mouth. What kind of a struggle are you having in just saying, I forgive? Love does not keep records. Love forgives. But at times we need the help of God. Let me give you a testimony. I read this, when I read this story, I was so surprised. One of the rich guys abroad, one of the countries abroad, had only one child, a son. And this man is a millionaire, if not a billionaire. His son was killed, murdered by another person. His only son, his only child was murdered by somebody. The murderer was arrested, taken to court, you know, these cases take a while. When the case was going on, this man went into prayer and said, God, my son is dead. I can't do anything about it. 
what should I do? He was reminded of forgiveness. He went to the judge, to the courtroom, and he told them, I plead for this man. I forgive him. You know, a case can only go on if there is a complainant. I withdraw the case. Now, the next statement he made is what shocked even the court. He said, I have so much wealth. I don't, I don't know whom to give to. I want to adopt this man who killed my son. I'll adopt him as my son. The court could not believe it. It became a debate, but finally he was allowed. He adopted him as a son. What kind of forgiveness? What a way to forgive. If somebody could do that, why are you holding on to an event that happened between you and somebody else? Deal with it. Deal with it. Number three, remember that you have also hurt other people. James chapter 3 verse 2 talks about that. You have also hurt other people. I mean you. If you sit down and begin to look at your life and the people you have related with and the people you have connected to, you will discover there are people you hurt at some point. Now, suppose they did not forgive you. Suppose they, they came to revenge for what you did. It may have been small. It may have been small. But it's a reality. You had them. Maybe in school. Maybe in some form of relationship. Maybe in some form of conversation. I have not met anybody who has not hurt somebody. Either knowingly or unknowingly. Remember that. Because when you remember that, then you, you deal with bitterness. You refuse to impress bitterness against people. Because if people develop bitterness against you, it's not a good thing. You have also hurt other people. You may never have intended to hurt them, but you did. Number four, be genuine and real. I want to urge you to understand that forgiveness is not a story that you will do haphazardly, um, the way I hear people do at times. No, you've got to be genuine and you've got to be real with the forgiveness. Let me read your story here. I got this from an encyclopedia. King Henry VI of England had this said of him, and I quote, he never forgot anything but injuries. That King Henry VI, the only thing he forgot were injuries. He could not forget other things, but he forgot. He, he never wanted to keep injuries. So you could injure him, but he forgets it and moves forward. Ladies and gentlemen, there was a guy called Krenna, Krenma. This is what was said of him. If you wanted to get a favor from this man, do him wrong. Do something wrong against him. Then he'll give you favor. The kind of man who would make you comfortable because you have wronged him. There was a guy I love reading about called Emerson. This is what he said of, of President Lincoln of America. He said, and I quote, his heart was as great as the world, but there was no room in it for the memory of a wrong. The heart was great and big, but there was no space in that heart for a memory of the wrong done against him. That is Lingon. So people could do wrong things against him, but he had no space or memory for wrongs to be remembered. One of the great preachers I love studying about and reading about is Charles Spurgeon, who preached in England many years ago. This is what he says, and I quote, cultivate 
forbearance until your heart yields a fine crop of it. Pray for a short memory as to unkindness, end quote. As far as unkindness is concerned, let your memory be short. Cultivate, cultivate forbearance, forbearing with one another. People hurt you, but cultivate the culture of being patient and forbearing with one another. Um, somebody asked me a question one time, do people ever hurt you? I said, yeah. Do people ever let you down? I said, too many. What do you do? I said, I don't carry it in my heart. It's their choice. If, if they choose to do so, since I have not chosen to do so, I cannot do anything about that. Ladies and gentlemen, your attitude must be, I forgive. It must be, I forgive. In other words, it must be something you're not playing with. It's genuine. Don't say, if I hurt you, kwa wala ambao niliumiza, kama nilikuumiza, pengine nilikuumiza, no, you hurt somebody, you hurt somebody. Just be real. Apana sema, kama nilikuumiza, uli niumiza. Whenever somebody says, kama nilikuumiza, that means there's no genuineness. This has to be handled properly because we need to deal with that. Now, please, don't wait even for the person to come and say, forgive me. It is you who just forgives. Don't wait for them to come and ask for forgiveness first. I was chatting with a friend of mine and he said, me, I only forgive those who come to ask for forgiveness. No, you don't do that. Yeah, I, I, I read a quote. I may not say it verbatim, but this guy said something close to this, that forgiveness releases a prisoner Release a prisoner, a, a prisoner. And after forgiveness, you discover the prisoner was you. Forgiveness releases a prisoner. After the, after the forgiveness, you discover the prisoner was actually you. How? Because if you don't forgive, you become a prisoner. Allow me to say one more point as we close this session. Number five. Understand that forgiveness is good for you. Forgiveness is good for you. There is a quote, somebody calls it the best thing. Let me read it to you. The best thing to give to your enemy is forgiveness. The best thing to give to an opponent is tolerance. The best thing to give to a friend is your heart. The best thing to give your child is a good example. The best thing to give a father is de de deference. Deference means polite submission and respect. The best thing to give your mother is conduct that makes her proud of you. The best thing to give yourself is respect. The best thing to give all men is charity. The best. For your enemies, the best is forgiveness. Ladies and gentlemen, sicknesses and diseases have hurt people because of unforgiveness. Emotional wounds have been carried for many generations. According to Dr. Barry in his book, The Healing Project, and I want to quote this, he says, harboring negative emotional anger and hatred creates a state of chronic anxiety. Chronic anxiety produces adrenaline, excess adrenaline and, and cortisol, which deplete the production of, of natural killer cells, which is your body's foot soldier in the fight against cancer. He says suppressed anger can cause you problems. The doctor says this, an excess of, of cortisol and adrenaline is produced when there is unforgiveness because of extended anxiety, which causes pain. And he says very clearly that it promotes cancer development in a body. 
if you don't forgive, you will have difficulties, ladies and gentlemen, in dealing with wrongs done to you. You will have difficulties because you will develop bitterness, resentment, and other issues may find room in your spirit. And forgiveness is a bad thing. Love does not keep wrongs. I want to welcome the worship team as we worship God together. There's not a friend like Jesus. Have you discovered there's no friend like Jesus? All friends can be temporal. The friendship with our Lord Jesus is permanent. And as we do that song, I want to ask you, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to welcome you home to God's kingdom. Accepting Jesus is nothing strange. It's just coming back home to where you belong. Accepting Christ makes you a child of God. It's like fish going back to water. It's like a plant that was uprooted from the ground going back to the soil. It gets life again. When you get born again, that's what you do. You give your life to Christ and you come back home. Father, I pray for the sick this morning. I pray for those whose hearts are broken, those paining because they have been hurt, those who are going through challenges because they, things have happened to them. I pray for them, Lord. I pray for those, that family which is breaking because of unforgiveness and bitterness and the wrongs that have been kept. I pray, Lord, that you will forgive, you will intervene, and you will help. It's not a friend like Jesus. welcome you to give an offering or a tithe or a gift to this work and the Lord 
has given us opportunity to serve him. So many pastors are hurting just all over this town. And today I'm going to be making some provision for some of those pastors. I want to, I'm, looking, I'm going to be giving some food to some of them, like 20 of them. I've seen their pain. They don't even make, not even 500 shillings in a week. And I've seen what they're going through, so I'm having some, some projects this afternoon to take care of at least 20 this week. I don't know how much. I'll do it again maybe next week or something. I'm not sure. But I want to ask you to stand with us as we stand with the needy, as we do the work of the ministry. Listen to this. One, Jesus expects you to give. Matthew chapter 6, verse 2. When you give, not, not uh, if you give. He says when you give. Secondly, we need to give for the right reasons. And I want to give you a chance to give for the right reason. Thirdly, we need, we need to be charitable in our giving. Matthew 6, verse 2. We need to show love as we give. And fourthly, our giving is ultimately to God. Matthew 6, verse 3 to 4. When we give, we are giving to God. Although we are giving to church, but at the end of the day, it is to God. Five, giving is an act of worship. Matthew 6, verse 3 to 4. When we give, we are actually expressing our heart of worship to God. Number six, learn to give sacrificially. Jesus sacrificed his life. Second Corinthians 8 verse 9. Learn to be sacrificial. Go beyond just what you have. Do more. Be a good human who can sacrifice. Number seven, giving should be in accordance with your means. Second Corinthians 8 12. Give according to your ability. We are not on the same level. Eight, Go, giving, uh, God's giving to us is directly proportional to our giving. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 6. What God gives to us is directly proportional to what we give uh, to stand with this cause. And so if we give sparingly, we receive sparingly. Number nine, it must be willing and free. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 7. Our giving must be from a willing heart. It also must be free. There should be no pressure. No manipulation, no force. If anybody manipulates you, don't give. It must come from a willing heart, a voluntary heart. And finally, number 10, give cheerfully. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 7. There must be cheerfulness in your giving so that God will receive it. And so, information is on the screen. You can use the M-Pesa pay bill line. You can use the uh, banking information that is on the screen. We guarantee you we are accountable to all the resources God gives us. God bless you. See you next week.